Hi, I'm Annie Thompson Almeida, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about a social work pioneer called Maud Ballington Booth. And uh, this is a historical and contextual critique of power and oppression within her life and, uh, and her work as a leader of the Salvation Army and a co-founder of the Volunteers of America. Um, I entitled this presentation, Look Up and Hope. This is a motto that prisoners that Booth worked with chose for their organization, and we're gonna get into that in a little bit. Um, here are some, just a few of the highlights of Booth's life and work. Uh, Booth was extremely passionate about serving the poor, especially women and children. And uh, one thing that she did when she co-founded Volunteers of America was to give men and women equality within the organization. Um, that was not present in the Salvation Army, so that was a change. And uh, in the Volunteer Prisoners League, she helped create our, our present day idea of what a halfway house uh, is uh, to help prisoners transition into civilian life. She was born as Maud Elizabeth Charlesworth in Surrey, England to Maria and Samuel Charles Charlesworth, who were both ministers to their local communities. Uh, her father was a reverend and he ministered to the middle class community near the church her mother, Maria, realized that there were many in the community that were very, very poor and didn't feel they could attend those services. And so she ministered to them especially. So Booth was surrounded by ministering and service of all kinds uh, from a very young age as she grew up in London. Um, she attended something called the Christian Mission and she went to services with her parents and uh, who helped the mission find a place to conduct meetings in a safe spot. Uh, this, this Christian mi mission was later, later called the Salvation Army. So um, it was, the Salvation Army was a really exciting space for Booth to be in. Um, she really especially enjoyed the the Christian part of it, and um, she and some of her of the other women that were in the Salvation Army were uh, were called Hallelujah Lassies uh, as they preached the gospels and and encouraged men to give up the alcohol, give up alcohol, follow God, um, and. Uh, all of those within the Salvation Army were termed uh, Salvationists, and they were popular in some areas and not so popular in others. So, uh, but she was very passionate about the work of the Salvation Army, and that is where she met her husband, who she, who was the son of William Booth, who was the founder and leader of the Salvation Army in England. So they met and then Booth's, William Booth gave the orders for uh, Maud and Ballington Booth to go to America to uh, work at the Salvation Army in New York, which is how they came over and started doing all sorts of service in America. Um, if you look at the the wheel of power and privilege, there basically Booth ticks almost all of the boxes uh, of being a a privileged person who had access to all sorts of resources. Uh, there are a couple things like. Uh, neurodiversity and mental health that I didn't necessarily have all of the all the information available to me um, but I am suggesting that because of 
uh, Booth's ability to lead her organization, uh, her ability to talk to people of influence and convince them to give to the organizations um, and to run many posts and increase her organizations, you know, tenfold, twentyfold, um, that there were no social issues. That is my suggestion that, um, that she is most likely neurotypical, uh, and that her mental health, uh, was pretty robust, uh, because, uh, especially since uh, one particular challenge that she had in her life was transitioning from the Salvation Army into Volunteers of America. Uh, her father-in-law, William Booth, didn't like how American the Salvation Army was becoming and wanted them to return to England, but her and her husband were so uh, passionate about all the work that they were doing and so they decided to resign from the Salvation Army so that they didn't have to take orders from his father, her husband's father, and to start their own organization called the Volunteers of America, which I think shows a lot of resiliency and a lot of de determination and uh, and so that is my uh, my conclusion from uh, looking at all of these points, um, the only thing that did not uh, not come up as a place of privilege was their wealth. Uh, she and her husband had access to a lot of wealthy individuals, but they themselves were not necessarily wealthy. Um, they were in a, a very poor situation when they left the Salvation Army because they were no longer being supported or funded by them. Um, and so that was very, it wasn't very stable in that situation. So, uh, but overall, I think most of her work was coming from the lens of a privileged individual. So politically, during the time uh, of her life, which was 1865 to 1948, um, we saw the Civil War end, slavery ended, Jim Crow laws came into effect, Lincoln was assassinated, the United States was becoming a major political power, Europeans were immigrating to the states, which was providing the labor for uh, these industries to grow and develop and increase. Transcontinental Railroad was built and women were beginning to find more equality with men, um, which happened with the women's suffrage movement in, uh, in the 1910s and uh, almost into 1920. But um, I think for Booth's position and what she was trying to accomplish, the trans Continental Railroad was the most important because that enabled her to travel and to set up all of these posts. Uh, many times it said that her and her husband were in different cities trying to set up posts for the Volunteers of America. Um, and that stretched all the way from New York to Chicago and then further on into Colorado. So uh, the goal was to have to have posts set up every, she would go to a, a smaller town, she would give a lecture or give a speech, convince people to join and start up their own post and it would happen. And then she'd move on to the next. Um, so she was very passionate about her work and was able to get uh, a lot of results. So other than the Volunteers of America, her, uh, her main, passion, which she found uh, in a little bit of, an, of a backward way, was, the, was serving and ministering to prisoners. Um, she found this because when she left, 
and developed Volunteers of America, she didn't want to compete with Salvation, Salvation Army. She was proud of the work that they did. Um, so she tried to find little gaps in the service area of Salvation Army in order to, um, to not compete, but to complement. And that was in the area of prisoners. And so she developed the Volunteer Prisoners League. Uh, this was a very interesting organization because it was done with, uh, with the prisoners who were still imprisoned um, by taking an oath to encourage others to not use negative language um, and they, when they came out of prison, they would join what she called hope houses. And uh, these were what we know as halfway houses. And uh, they led to such positive transitions for these prisoners into civilian life that 60 to 75% of them did not return to a life of crime after going through her program. Um, so, it was very, very effective. It was done through a Christian lens. There was uh, a lot of preaching the gospel and uh, and developing relationships with God. Uh, and uh, it, it was effective. The work itself was definitely challenging poverty. Uh, she was serving the poor at every step, but I can't find any information to suggest that she was actively anti-racist, that she was fighting against racism uh, in any way. And this would have been, I mean, it was a very uh, tumultuous time for people of color and for the whole country in terms of racism. And so, uh, I can't say that she wasn't serving populations of color, but I can't find anything to suggest that she was. So, um, looking at the process of becoming a social work pioneer, I, my first thought was who is reading this website to know that they should nominate someone. And then my second thought is probably people who are, you know, students of social work or newly social workers, people looking for continuing education uh, credits. And so that whole pool of people um, isn't exactly the always very diverse. Uh, I think we know that the those who have the financial and social privileges of being out educated are usually white. And um, so if white people are the only people to know about the process of this social work pioneer, then more white people are generally going to be nominated um, for, for this program. So, um, what that makes me want to know is to look into more about the doers who are in the marginalized communities who are advocating at this very moment, the, the people who have been fighting and starting, who started the Black Lives Matter movement, who have been active activists and advocating for their communities and who don't need a social work degree to do so, um, but are doing social work. Uh, so that, for me, that is the most interesting um, possibility. Uh, I, I like to find out about organizations that people run that are serving their communities and their ideas about how to run them um, because so many times we don't know, and I say we as uh, as a member of the white community, we don't know what the best way is to serve those marginalized communities and communities of people of color. And so I, I want, I'm curious about 
who those people are, what they're doing, what's working, um, and to learn more about it. So, thank you.